sometimes we need to be comforted, right? Especially in the unknown. And as fitting as that is, today marks a day of the unknown. We are at the beginning of an of a era where things are not known by us. Like yesterday, today wasn't known. And like tomorrow, the day after, you know, each day isn't known. It's only known by God. And with that being said, the text that we are going to read this morning is going to be John chapter 14. And in this text, we are going to see how Jesus comforts his disciples shortly before he leaves and departs for heaven. We're going to be reading John chapter 14, verse 1 to verse 17. If you are all are with me there, <clears throat> excuse me. The title of the sermon this morning is The Uncharted Waters of Faith. The Uncharted Waters of Faith. Let's all be honest, sometimes we feel a bit lost in our faith, right? Feel a bit lost in knowing, <coughs> excuse me, knowing to which extent are we to trust God? Where's our comfort in trusting God fully? Let's see what happens as we read our text this morning. The heading in my Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. <coughs> I graduated grade 12 from Henneman High School in the year 2000 and right after that in 2001 I left for the Navy, left my parents house into the great big world, the great unknown, I left for the Navy, Saldana Bay in the Western Cape. I was there from 2001 until 2002. I did a one-year basic training course in the South African Navy. Six months basic training where they try to get you fit and they try to turn you into a soldier where you get food that's healthy but not so tasty and not so bountiful and plenty as in mommy's cupboards at home. But you survived. 
After that six months was over, I went to Simon's town and I started to serve on a ship. The ship was called the SAS Otaniqua. It's decommissioned now, but at that time it was South Africa's biggest independent ship. So what does that mean? An independent ship means it was a flagship for other vessels that was in distress. And the Otaniqua could go to them and aid them in whatever need they had at that specific point in time. So it was South Africa's biggest ship <clears throat> at that time. When I was on that ship, the first time we sailed, we sailed to Reunion. Reunion is French islands off the coast of Madagascar. And so we sailed to these islands. The very first night we sailed, we, we went around Cape Point towards Cape Agulhas. And lo and behold, we hit a storm. And not just any little old storm, we hit a real storm. To give you some statistics of the ship that I was in, when it's loaded, it weighs 21,000 tons. Okay? It is 166 meters long or 546 feet. It is 22.6 meters across or 74 feet. The rank that I had while I was in the Navy was a seaman. That was the lowest of the ranks, okay? So we lived in containers, these shipping containers that were stacked on top of each other and they were chained, they were held together by chains. So we are in this storm. I was living in that container with five other guys and the bed that I had to lie on was a bit shorter than that table and a bit narrower. That was the size of my bunk. So here I am, lying on that bunk, not in my parents' house, completely away from my comfort. At least I've been there for six months now. But still, I'm lying there, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And as you are lying on that bunk, the waves on the outside of the ship crashes against that ship. Remember, the ship weighs 21 tons. And the force of those waves was so strong that it tilted that massive ship both ways, up to 30 degrees, both ways, right? And as this ship goes over the waves, you feel the motion taking you with that ship and you feel light as if you are floating. But as it goes down into the waves, you feel the pressure of that weight coming down on that ship and onto you. And you hear the outside of that ship goes like, it goes like, it cracks like that. Even though I was with five other guys in that container that night, I felt so alone. I felt so alone. And the emotions that I had was fear. I felt anxious. I even doubted the training that I just underwent for six months whether I would be able to remember anything if we were to sink. Given at that point in time, I wasn't a believer in Christ, but I felt those emotions. And I know full well that as Christians, we sometimes experience those emotions too. Fear, anxiety, doubting even if Jesus is enough if He is enough or even able to comfort us in the extent that we need to be comforted. Therefore, it is my hope this morning that through this text and that we would be able to see three things in this text this morning. That comfort is found in Jesus Christ, that Jesus is very exclusive and that the Father is tender in his consideration for the weakness of man. Those three things. Comfort is found in Christ. Jesus is exclusive. And that the Father is tender in his considerations to the weaknesses of man. Let's pray. <coughs> Our Father, we thank you for this day. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. Father, even though we find ourselves in the midst of 
uncharted waters where we see nothing but waves crashing against the side of a ship. Father, where we experience nothing but fear and anxiety, loneliness, hopelessness. Father, thank you that, that you are there. Father, we pray that this time that we spend together as we seek to study your word, that you will be revealed father to us that we would get to see your glory and your majesty father that we would get to see your faithfulness that we would get to experience your comfort father and that we would get to see jesus thank you lord that we get to be here this morning thank you father that you are faithful and father that everything we ask in your name that it will be done according to your word. We praise you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so the first three verses of our text, verse 1 to 3, explains to us the comfort that we are to find in Christ. All of us in this room this morning, gathered here together, we suffer from the same thing. We suffer from the same thing. It's not health issues, it's not height issues, nothing like that. All of us, we suffer from a troubled heart. Our hearts are troubled. And look at how Jesus starts this conversation with the disciples in verse 1. He says to them, let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. And in these verses, we see the remedy that Jesus has for a troubled heart. And that is faith. That is faith. And that is a substance that is part of the foundation of Christianity, right? Is to have faith. He says to them, let not your hearts be troubled. That word troubled is the same word used for Christ's own inner disturbances if you look at John chapter 12 verse 27 it says now my soul is troubled and what shall I say father save me from this hour but for this purpose I have come to this hour like we are troubled sometimes Jesus also experienced trouble while he was on this earth right that word means the same as the trouble that he experienced while he was on earth. The question though is what causes a troubled heart? What causes a troubled heart? What bothers us? Fear? Like I had? The unknowns of 2023? Are we troubled about that? Are we worried about that? J.C. Ryle commented on that and he says a troubled heart it is one of the most commonest things in the world no one is exempt from it no bars bolts or locks can keep it out it is formed partly from inward causes and outward causes the body the mind what we love and what we fear isn't that true a troubled heart is formed partly from inward causes. What we believe about ourselves. How we look on the outside. What we fear can cause us to have a troubled heart. The journey of life that all of us are involved in is full of trouble. And even the best of Christians have many bitter cups to drink between grace and glory. Faith in the Lord Jesus is the only sure medication for a troubled heart. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 17 to 20 reads as follows. It says, So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of His purpose, He guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to refuge 
and fled for refuge, might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What does that mean for us? For us, that means we have to keep in mind, okay, that everybody represented here this morning, this life is temporary. It's not, none of us here are immortal, right? It's going to end at some point in time. For example, let's say in 60 years, most of us in this room will either be passed on to glory, or if I think of my own children, they would be retired, almost, almost retired. Time is nothing. You see, it's about eternity. It's all about eternity. And we have to believe that by His suffering and exaltation, Christ will obtain a place for all of us with the Father in heaven. Right? Christ will do that. He will obtain a place for us with the Father in heaven. And because of that, it's a solid ground for expecting good things to come. Lighthouses. Lighthouses are... All of us know what lighthouses are, right? Those buildings erected along the coastline, they have lights in them, big lights that turn around when they are switched on. And the purpose of those lighthouses is to keep ships safe, to warn them that there's rocky edges close by, or to warn them about storms. Lighthouses have a very specific function. And those lighthouses, more than often, they are built on rocks. Those rocks that you see along the coastline, solid foundation, firm rocks. And they are, some of them are 40 to 50 meters, some of them are even 80 meters high, very high, because the ships have to see them from a, a far off distance. Sometimes some of those lighthouses that are built into the ocean, a, a, a few, you know, a few hundred meters into the ocean, they get struck by waves so big and so high that the water goes over the top of those lighthouses. But the fact of the matter remains that they remain sturdy. Even though the waves may crash, they remain sturdy. Wave after wave after wave after wave, they take that force. They stand erected. They remain firm. Why? Because of the solid foundation that they are built upon. You see, the heart of unbelief within us is apt to rob us of our comfort in Christ. The question is, have you ever battled with yourself? <laughs> have you ever fought with yourself in your mind saying, how can you do something like that? That's not who you are. But yet you find yourself doing the thing that you do not want to do. Paul speaks about that in Romans chapter 7, right? He says, that what I strive to do, I don't do it. And that what I don't want to do, I find myself doing that. He fought with himself in his mind. And likewise, we sometimes fight with ourselves in our own minds about our faith. We argue with ourselves about our faith. And mainly because of our past, right? All of us lived a life before we met Jesus at the cross. And that life that we have lived, mine might have been worse than yours, or yours might have been worse than the next person. It doesn't matter. The equalizer is that all of us are guilty of one thing that's unavoidable, and that is sin. All of us are guilty of sin, and that is the life that we lived before we met Jesus at the cross. 
Having met Jesus at the cross doesn't mean that we are sinless. It means that we are righteous. And because of the life that we live, we fight with ourselves and we say, you cannot be saved. Jesus cannot love you. Jesus couldn't have come to the cross for you, for me, because I was such a so-and-so, such a bad person who did X, Y, and Z. That's a lie. Jesus did come to the cross exactly for that. Exactly to be made sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. Right? We keep on fighting with ourselves. And we ask ourselves this question then. Why? If it's so difficult, if I'm experiencing these thoughts, why then am I still trusting? Looking at the world outside. Looking at our local town, at Velkom. The, 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 the condition that our town is in. The roads, the buildings. There was a time I remember as a child, my father had family living in Velkom. And as a child, I wasn't born in Velkom. As a child, we would come up to visit Velkom and we looked forward to coming here because it was such a beautiful place. Even the water tasted nice. <laughs> Velkom was a nice place to stay. Each circle, flowers and lovely, the parks, such a beautiful place. Looking at Velkom now, you want to take your hat off your head and throw it away and say, I give up. I'm going to Wesselsbronn or something. <laughs> Desperation. That is where we are sometimes. We look at our town. I look at my life. I look at my home. My relationships. Will I ever find peace? The answer to that question is yes. There is peace to be found. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 1 to 4 reads as follows. It says, In that day this song will be sung. In the land of Judah we have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Will I find peace? Peace is to be found. These people that Isaiah wrote to, they didn't live in peaceful circumstances and conditions. Believe me, it looked worse than welcome. But they found peace. Is peace to be found for you? Yes. Why? Because one, comfort is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus is exclusive. And the Lord is tender in His consideration for the weakness of man. We are weak. We are weak feeble human beings right and god knows that we are going to fail and he knows that we are going to slip and he knows that we are sinful therefore he's tender in his considerations to the weakness of man church are we struggling to navigate these uncharted waters of faith i am struggling sometimes sometimes my wife has to bring me back on course and say mm -mm, that's not what the Bible says that's not what scripture teaches and that's a good thing it's a good thing we need those reminders comfort is found in Christ you see Christ comforts his people but it's only realized and accepted by faith those people that Jeremiah spoke to they had to have faith right like us this morning we have to have faith this chapel again is separated by one thing we cannot for one moment believe that all of us 
in here are believers. It's a sad reality. We are separated by unbelief and by belief. We are not separated by race, ethnicity, color, length, width. We are not separated by that. We are separated by the fact if we, whether we believe or whether we, not, we don't believe. Whether we entrust the salvation of our souls in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ or we don't. That is what separates us. You see, Scripture is very clear when it speaks about Christ, His sacrifice and eternity. If we read Hebrews, <coughs> excuse me, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25 to 28, it reads as follows. Nor was it to offer Himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting from Him, waiting for Him. You see, Christ's sacrifice, that single offering of Himself, is superior to everything else and sufficient for all His followers for all time. That single one offering is superior to everything else for all His followers for all time. It cannot be reversed. It cannot be erased. It cannot be beaten. There is no other Christ. There never will be another Christ. Verse 26 in that text that I just read says, Since the foundation of the world. And we think back to Genesis, right? Since the foundation of the world. It points back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 3. And the need of a sin offering because that's where it all began that's where the problem came in that's where the need for a sin offering started it points back to then beloved all of us here are appointed to die we are appointed to die once and then after that eternity and judgment right and that thought, that truth, it cancels the thought of maybe I can come back as a woman. Or maybe I can come back as a little puppy dog. It cancels the thought of reincarnation. Or maybe after death I have a second chance to believe, to have faith, to trust. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 says for he says in a favorable favorable time sorry in a favorable time i listened to you and in a day of salvation i have helped you behold now is the favorable time behold now is the day of salvation Meaning that after death, when this life ends for each and every one of us, whenever that day comes, that's the end. There's no second chance. God says the day of salvation is now. He says, I listened to you. I have helped you. By providing Jesus, right? By providing that one offer that's superior to all offers. Abraham and Isaac on the mountain, God tells Abraham, go and offer your son. And he even elevates it. He says, your only son, go and offer him to me. And Abraham, in faithfulness and obedience, goes to the mountain to slay Isaac. And as he's about to kill his son, God stops him. And he says to him, Abraham... 
I know now, now, now know that you trust me. Are we trusting God this morning? And God provides an offer on that day. And He points to Jesus, the greater offer, the better offer, the superior offer. He's enough. He's enough. He will always be enough. Christ is enough. That's why Jesus is exclusive in His saying. If we look at verse 6, and that verse is one of Jesus' most loved statements. It's a precious summary in a few words of all that He is for all, that is, for all of His people. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Jesus, as the way to the Father, fulfills Old Testament symbols and teachings that show the exclusiveness of God's claim in John chapter 3, verse 18. And it says, John chapter 3, verse 18, it says to us, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Whoever believes is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. And you might think, but that's a bit unfair, that's a bit harsh. You might feel as if you are not being offered a chance to believe, but we are. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians, the day of salvation is now. Jesus, with all due respect, does not save us in death. The greatest comfort in life is knowing that we belong to Christ in this life and in death. We have to know that now. We cannot work out that equation in our minds after we pass. We have to know that now. You see, church, it comes down to this. If we do not believe or trust in Christ, we have a problem. Because we have neither a positive or a neutral standing before God. In actual fact, we have no standing before God if we do not believe. We are condemned. We are guilty. We are found out because we do not trust Yahweh's salvation for guilt, which is His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's do a bit of introspection this morning. Search myself. How am I doing in this? We can fill in the blank on that question on our own. You see, the question then, Welcome Baptist Church, do we still trust in that name? It doesn't matter how sincere a person might be in following a religion. The fact is, apart from Christ, there is no eternal life. Apart from Christ, there is no eternal life. Acts chapter 4 verse 12, very exclusive when he says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's only Jesus. It will always be only Jesus. Now we might be thinking, given the occasion and yesterday and New Year's Day, celebrating New Year's Day, on our way to church this morning, we saw people still celebrating 2023 gazebo set up and beverages on the table <laughs> you know adult beverages on the table people are still celebrating 2023 and you might be thinking why is this man preaching at me this morning and not to me I came to church to hear some good news I came to church to be comforted 
I came to church this morning to be soothed. You see, it is the 1st of January and we might still be in a party mood this morning. Last night we had a party, our neighbors had a party, a good, a calm party. But when we went to bed, I told Uncle Howard before the service this morning, it was the first time that I was thankful for load shedding. (laughs) Because at 12 o'clock when the power went off, the music just, it died down. A few hours later, the fireworks ended and you could hear, hmm. Some people are also thankful for load shedding. We are not here to be soothed. We are here to be comforted in the fact that this is good news. That is good news. That what we celebrated this morning, that is what it's about. That is the good news. We referred earlier back to Genesis chapter 3. And God made a covenant with man, a covenant of grace, saying to the woman, with your seed, through your seed, he will crush the serpent's head, but he will strike him in the heel. And that promise finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. That is why we celebrated this morning the good news in remembrance of that day when Jesus went to the cross and said, it is finished. When Jesus completed the work of reuniting sinful man with the righteous, just and holy God. That is what we are celebrating and that is the good news. You see, because comfort church is found in Christ. Jesus is exclusive and God is tender in his consideration for the weakness of man. Therefore Jesus shuts out all other ways of salvation except through him. John again John chapter 1 verse 14 to 18 As the truth, Jesus fulfills the Old Testament teachings again by revealing the Father. And John, John is full of Old Testament teachings. And it refers back to the Old Testament. And from verse 14 to verse 18 it reads, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Through Jesus, God is showing us grace. Through grace. Scripture says, grace upon grace. Wow, that must be mind-blowing. Grace upon grace. Jesus alone is the life that was promised by God. Because he has life in himself, he is able to give life. Do we believe that? You see, the fallenness of our sinful being is that we think that we can add to that. We can take something out of our pocket and add it next to the communion and say, because of that and that, I can proclaim Christ. It's not what it is like. You see, we have the right means, which is the teachings of Scripture, right? But we try to do it our own way. I'm thinking of an illustration that I want to share with you. It's quite graphic, but please bear with me. We have a big yard. Those of you that haven't been 
into our house because we have quite a big yard, okay? And to cut the grass, man, it's a lot of work. And for me, they don't like to work in the garden because if I cut grass here and I go to the next place and I see that there's one uneven, I go back to that place, you know, because I want to try and even everything out. So actually, I hate cutting the grass. <laughs> So that day, I bought on the push cutters from Morningstar, okay? And we have a little courtyard, and it's a nice piece of lawn in the courtyard. Now, our doggy also lives in the courtyard. And it's my son's job to pick up after the doggy. So that day, I cut the grass with the push cutter. And I'm dressed for this occasion. I'm in old clothes, long pants, I even have the shin pads on everything. But I didn't have the face shield on. <laughs> I didn't have the face shield on that came with the bush cutter. I only put on safety goggles. And so I'm busy cutting the grass. And everything's running smoothly. And here, at the one point, we just before I finish that piece of grass, there lies a little doggy to you. And I thought to myself, this bush cut and turns so quickly, it will just cause this file to disintegrate. <laughs> Which it did. It did cause it to just disappear. And so when I ran over that to the bush cut, it did disappear, but not sideways as I was expecting. Everything <laughs> blew up in my face. Okay? So these little Chunks was hanging on my beard. I looked like a decorated Christmas tree. <laughs> on the side of the bottle is one big splash like that. It didn't look nice. It didn't smell nice. The moral of the story is that we have to use the right tool for the right job. <laughs> and when it comes to our faith, this is the tool for that job. This is what we need to navigate those uncharted waters. We do not run over things that wasn't intended to be run over with, with the wrong tool. It doesn't work like that. But that's our fallenness. And like Philip in verse 8 of our text, Moses also asked the Father to reveal His glory in Exodus chapter 33 verse 18 and 19. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus replies to him in verse 9. He said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? You see, in Jesus' reply, he kept with the Old Testament teaching of not allowing Philip to see the glory of God yet. Or allowing Moses to see the glory of God yet. But God spoke about grace in that text. And where that expression of grace comes from, it refers to God's covenant people at that time. The nation of Israel, right? And again, doesn't that make us feel a little bit left out? Because I'm not an Israelite. I'm not a traditional Jew. But according to John, God's covenant faithfulness found its ultimate expression in God sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to reunite a sinful man with a just and righteous God. Meaning that that grace that God spoke about in Exodus applies to us today through Jesus Christ, His Son. And that reveals to us the Lord's tender consideration for the weakness of His people. The question, I mean, we've spoken about this, and sometimes we are scared, right? We are afraid, frightened. And I'm not speaking about being scared of a dog that you are walking by that's biting at the wire or, you know, the fence. Or being scared of a friend or being scared of a teacher. 
or being scared of a mother or a father. I'm talking about really being frightened. Frightened to the point that you feel if you don't run away now, something is going to grab hold of you. Again, when I was in the Navy, after the first six months of our basic training, when just before I climbed onto the ship and started to serve there, we were at a, a, a course in one of the barracks in Simonstown called Waterberg. It was an old sailor's barrack. And what they used it for is they used to house sailors from the sea in those barracks. And then if they were sick, they were treated there. So some of them passed away there. And there's one night I had to go to the bathroom. And the room that we slept in was a long ways from the bathroom. In the same hall, you know, it's the same passage, but a long ways from the bathroom. And so I went and I went to the bathroom. And as I left the bathroom, I just felt afraid. I felt scared because I was in the dark, okay? And in my room, there was light. The light switch was still on. And the urge in me to run towards the, towards the light just took over. And I just started running, 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 running in that passage towards the light. And there's a spiritual lesson in this. Because how does John introduce Jesus? It's the light of the world, right? And the context of our sermon this morning is comfort. Jesus is comforting His disciples because of their discomfort knowing that the light of the world is about to leave. They are going to be left behind in a dark world. In verses 12 to 15, we see Jesus, like I said, comforting His disciples, knowing that they were faint-hearted and troubled about the prospect of being alone in the world. He comforts them and us by three promises that He leaves them with. Three peculiar promises for our needs and circumstances. The first one is the works that Christians do. Verse 12, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Here Jesus is teaching his disciples to imitate the things he did in his life and ministry. So what are we to imitate of Jesus? What are we to imitate about him? His zeal for the Father, his compassion, his love, his empathy, and also his correction, right? That's part of who Jesus was. You see, these greater works that verse 12 speaks about will only be possible because Jesus is going to the Father after His finished work on the cross, indicating that it would be possible because of the power of the Holy Spirit who would be sent after Jesus goes to the Father. Let's be very clear. This needs to be understood that the things that Jesus did in His earthly ministry while on earth, we are not able to do those things. I'm not able to raise anybody from the dead. I'm not able to open anybody's blind eyes or deaf ears or to make a lame man that's lying there for 38 years to stand in front of him and tell him, take off your bed and walk, go home. I'm not able to do that. To be quite frank with you, I don't know if I have enough faith even to try and attempt something like that. So the greater works is not to be understood in that context, the greater works that we as believers are to do points to evangelism, our teaching in righteousness, deeds of mercy and compassion. In short, it points to the entire ministry of the church, to the entire world. And all of us are involved in that. Right? The second promise that Jesus leaves His disciples with is the value of prayer. The value of prayer. 
Verse 13 and 14 speaks about prayer. And I have to ask you, what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? All of us pray like that, right? When we start the prayer, we pray. And when we end, we say, in Jesus' name, Amen. Or some other context says, be healed in the name of Jesus. You know, that's not the right context. So what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? Praying in Jesus' name means praying in a way that is consistent with His character and His will. Praying in Jesus' name means praying in a way that is consistent with His character and His will. In the ancient world, a person's name represented what the person was like. That was the belief in the ancient world. It represented what the person was like. So, in saying that, we can then therefore come to the Father in the name of Jesus, right? In the authority of Jesus. Which then gives us the third promise that Jesus leaves His disciples with. The promise of the Holy Spirit. So who is the Holy Spirit? He is the Spirit of truth. He will guide us in all truth. John chapter 16. He will serve as another helper. Verse 16 in our text. He will indwell Jesus' followers forever functioning as His emissaries in His physical absence. That is who the Holy Spirit is. And Romans chapter 8 verse 26 to 27 teaches us that He is the third person in the Trinity who is instrumental in His work and salvation and is worthy for the praise yielded to both the Father and the Son. Making Him part of the Trinity. That's who the Holy Spirit is. So in conclusion, 2023 has kicked off. We are in the starting blocks of a new year. And maybe there is some fear there because 2022 was marked with certain challenges. One of my biggest challenges of 2022 was the passing of my father. I lost a loved one, a dear loved one. And it was hard for me and my whole family. We spent our first Christmas without my dad. And it was especially hard on my mom. So my year ended in a challenge. It might also start in a challenge. And what is needed for those is faith in Christ. Trust in God. You see, it is a time of the year where resolutions are made and certain goals are set and all of us do that i remember when i was a smoker i would say this i'm quitting now now beginning of the year i'm finishing just to realize in the end that it's a lie there's nothing wrong with making resolutions and setting goals for yourself Still we find ourselves struggling with these things, trying to navigate these uncharted waters. Therefore we have to remember what we have read in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17 to 20. Jesus, He went in before us. He created the way for us to the Father, to God. He's the forerunner of our faith. Look to Him. Keep your eyes on Him. Focus on Him. Remember, comfort is found in Christ. Jesus is exclusive. And the Lord is tender in His consideration to His people, to man. Let us then go into 2023 with two things in mind. Two things. First of all, with serious self-examination of how much They miss who live in a dying world and yet know nothing of God as their Father and Christ as their Savior. And secondly, how much they possess who live the life of faith in the Son of God and believe in Jesus 
with all their weaknesses that they have, which the world can, ne- can neither give nor take away. A true friend when they live, and a true home when they die. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that our comfort is found in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that he is so exclusive, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you, Father, that there is no comparison. Thank you, Father, that his sacrifice surpasses all other things, is superior, cannot be equaled, cannot be cancelled out. Thank you, Father, that you are kind, that you are tender to our shortcomings. We ask, I ask, Father, this morning that your Spirit will apply the truths of your word this morning in the hearts of people, in the hearts of man, that he would complete his work, his role in salvation. Father, we pray this morning that your will will be done in every aspect of our lives. And as we enter 2022, or 2023, may we be mindful of the fact that there are those that do not believe in you, yet there are those that do believe in you. And for those that do believe in you, let us not sit back and find comfort in the fact that we are saved, but let us go out. Let our evangel- evangelism, our good deeds of mercy, Father, let our teaching in righteousness be to the extent of expanding your kingdom, not for our sake and glory, but for yours and yours alone. We love you, Father, and we pray in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Thank you.